Hey, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop. How's everybody doing out there? Uh, we have a great guest tonight. And as voice actors, we all have to have demos. And people complain about their demos or they love their demos. And there's so many guys producing and gals, so many people producing demos. We figured, why don't we have somebody who knows a lot about making demos on the show? And so our guest tonight is Hugh Klitsky. Say hello, Hugh. Hello, Hugh. Oh, very good. <laughs> it's two weeks in a row. Deb Irwin did that last time. <laughs> We're on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I need to rephrase maybe, maybe the question. Could be, could be because you know she and I like know each other, so that's, it's like that, hmm, maybe mm, that's why. Maybe hmm. that's why. So, are we all ready out there? If you got a question, throw it in the chat room because Jeff Holman, who I is like out of the frame right now, but he's he's here and he will here. be taking your questions and relaying those to us. Are we ready, Mister Whitham? Ready to go. All right, voiceover body shop right now. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature products. Source Elements, the folks who bring you Source Connect. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. VoiceActor.com, your voiceover website ready in minutes. VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for voiceover success. And by World Voices, the industry association of freelance voice talent. And now, here's your hosts, Dan and George. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or V-O-B-S. So, got a gift this week. Mike Derner sent us this wonderful mic flag because really nice. everybody was tired 3D of the one print I print that or something. No, it's on a 3d printer. Somebody is doing these with 3d printers awesome. and you know, the people like me who collect old microphones, it's like, well, you got to get the flags. So, Very cool. And it looks a lot better than the one, the paper one that was printed out like four or five years ago and kept trying to find different ways to <laughs> yeah. stick it on the mic. And thanks Mike. This, it's cool. Yeah, but you know, as soon as I, as soon as we're done, I can just take it off and. Oh, that's even that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. As long as it doesn't interfere with the diaphragm at all, do I sound okay like it with does. this? It's up high okay. enough. Yeah. You know, if if anything, it makes me sound better and look more professional. Anyway, <laughs> tonight we got have a great guest. We're going to talk about demos, and demos are, of course, very very important. So why don't we introduce our guest, and that way we can get into a discussion of this. Uh, Hugh Klitsky is a voiceover coach, director, and producer in New York City. He teaches the conversational read, self-direction, the commercial read, and Dick directs auditions, as he says, amongst other things. Uh, Hugh has directed uh, booking auditions for commercials, animation, ADR, politicals, podcasts, narration, games, audiobooks, promos, affiliates, trailers, e-learning, and industrials, which is just about everything <laughs> let's welcome to voiceover body shop hugh klitsky <laughs> welcome hi guys how you doing tonight good thanks all right that was a long introduction but then again you have a lot of stuff that you do and in, in directing it so tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this nutso business it's, it was purely by accident i it, was well, back in the day, I was I was uh, something of an odd low point in my life. I was selling cell phones at Radio Shack, and was casting about. I was a uh, I did my uh, graduate and undergraduate work in uh, music composition, and I had worked with some mm. filmmakers who uh, in grad school who um, knew that I was looking for something to do. All my freelance work, all my music work, had dried up, and I had to turn to, as a friend of mine put it, an alter an alternative lifestyle you know, to support myself at the time. And I wound up scoring an independent film for a fellow who had absolutely no budget. And I said to him, okay, I get it. You have no money. All your friends got to do it. And the interesting thing though, the acting was really good, but the film was a, was a art film and it was kind of odd. And that's a important part of the story. 
And I said to the guy, I don't know if you can help me with this, but it don't work for free. But if people can't afford to pay me, they barter with me, they do me favors. And what I want more in the universe than anything right now is a better job than my day job because my day job sucks. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, okay, what about my old day job? I said, I don't know what you did. <laughs> he was the voice over casting director at the agency. And it turned out that the talent in his film were all signed actors who came in and did his film for him as a favor. And I interviewed on a Friday at nine in the morning. I got a call at three o'clock in the afternoon. I got hired. And to my surprise, I said, wow, that's great. Thanks. That sounds fantastic. Now, what am I going to do? <laughs> and you because i didn't know anything about it i didn't know anything about the work i didn't know about anything that was going on but i was trained on site you know they had another agent who had trained all of the people that did the job after him and most of those folks lasted for about a year maybe a year and a half in the position and i stayed for almost 15 years wow well you're gonna you're gonna learn a thing or two over that period of time so, and you were there for 15 years. And Almost, now, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, it was I, less than that, but it sounds good if you round that number up, right? Just, you know, just say nearly, 15, and a half nearly and, 15 yeah. years, you know, it just sounds good. <laughs> that sounds like my broadcasting career. Yeah, I was in it for 15 years. They paid me for 12 of them, but, you know. Um, so now you're, you're, you're not, you're producing demos, but I'm you're not coach. really known for that. Yeah, I'm a coach primarily. Yeah, but. I knew that when we had talked about my being on here, we just discussed the idea of, you know, maybe I could talk about demos. And I said, sure, I could talk about demos because I do produce them. I don't feel like I produce a whole lot of them, but people come to me with very, very specific ideas and very, very specific questions. I rarely produce anyone's first demo. I usually produce their second, maybe even their third. Often students of mine who have coached with me They'll say, do you? And if I say yes, and then that becomes part of our, that after working with me for a while, and they, they have changed, developed their skill set in a different way, they then trust me to show that off to the very best of my ability because I understand them. Yeah, I mean, you can so much more effectively coach somebody or direct somebody and produce a very convincing demo when you're coaching them and you know all their strengths and weaknesses and having gone through, I think many people probably did go through that first demo and it was done on a, on a, probably on a shoestring budget, maybe very, very quickly, or maybe they spent a lot of money on it, but it was still done very quickly or the script was generic or maybe the script was 10 years old, which somebody recently told me on the side. <laughs> a very prominent demo producer did their first demo. He found out years later that he shouldn't have a 10 year old commercial script on his demo. Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's the things that people learn. And so when they get to do that second time with you, they really, they're going to get a much, much better product and they're going to appreciate the skills you bring to the table. The thing that troubles me most sometimes is, is not just the direction, but more the casting. I find that the fit of the right content to the individual is so important. But at the same time, I also know that I'm speaking from my own experience because casting was essential in the agency world. And so I was constantly around the thinking and the questions and the ideas of what's the difference between this person being able, being able to perform something versus somebody who's the right fit for something that fits the request. And then to try to synthesize that into a, with a demo is very, very important. And I don't think that can really be underestimated because I hear demos and again, I'm speaking from my experience, what's in, what I value when I listen. And I'm sitting there going, that content doesn't match. They would never be cast for this. Why is that on their demo? You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't fit. And then I'm not paying even, even really paying attention to the read, to the production, to anything else. And that's a very, very fine line because people want to be aspirational with their demo. They want to be able to say, 
this is what I'm capable of doing. This is what I want. I want to be able to show that off. But if it's not a good fit for you in the first place, then already you're 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 losing. Yeah. Well, what are the good elements of a demo? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's the the basic stuff. Your name, uh, <laughs> and and you don't even slate them anymore. It's just. You know, what, what is it that, that you should I have think, in a demo? I think they should be slated, but I think they should be slated by somebody who's not you. Ah, I think they should yeah. be slated by somebody who's of the opposite gender as you was also mm. as well. Because I think it's, I think there's a psychological benefit to having somebody set you up. I mean, statistically, it's proven that people that are, have other people speak on their behalf, they earn more money. And I mm. think that when somebody of the opposite gender slates your name, they're like, oh, this person has somebody else that believes in them. Right. This then a, prefer, a pro, yeah. Then they can, what do you call it? They'll listen in a different way. Right. You know, it's, it's very subtle. What goes into a good demo? I think a demo has to actually, I think a demo needs to be a little entertaining, believe it or not. I think you actually have to like listening to it. And that's kind of difficult to capture. I think that you have to, you have to hold people's attention in the right way at from the very, very beginning. And then you have to conclude very, very well at the end, perhaps even having the beginning of a spot up front and the end of a spot at the end. I think demos have to have variety. I think that demos have to be, they have to show certain kinds of skills. They have to show that you can interpret copy well. They have to show that you can tell story. They have to be a, a strong representation of the artist that you are right now. And then in turn, your skill set has to be able to back that up. So as we were talking before on the beginning, you know, Dan was saying how, yeah, I want you to do it like you did on the fourth cut of your demo. Well, then the, the talent is there trying to remember what the fourth cut was, you know, and that can be very, very. Now you're showing your age. But I'm, I'm, <laughs> but I'm not of that age too. You know, I am old enough to have cut tape, but not a lot of it, not a lot. But yeah, I, I am old enough to have cut tape. It's, it has to have, it has to have variety. It has to show knowledge of marketplace. It has to show where your voice is likely to be sold. Yeah. That if you and if you have an interest or a strength that you have knowledge base. For example, I'm producing a demo now. This person has a background in broadcast journalism focus on finance. And she, when she um, auditions for things, she gets lots of likes in whichever of the, the pay for play sites she's on, specifically around finance. So I'm immediately like, yep, we gotta have that for sure. There has to be a finance spot on your demo. But she's never really thought about pharma. So I think that she needs to have a disclaimer, for example, a black box warning, for example, on her demo, because that's also important. And those two are kind of like cousins in a way, just in certain parts of the read, just a little bit. I can, I can hear that, that uh, black box, fair balance warnings, black box warnings, fair balance warnings have to put over information clearly and responsibly. And I can hear that in, in the business reads in certain spots, maybe for like Sunday morning business shows, if they're in there for those specific kind of investment portfolios to be able to command and hold attention, but perhaps still temper that with a bit of warmth or a bit of approachability. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mean when they have cousins, they're elements of the reads that have certain similarities. What is the, Where, what is the black, I'm, I'm, I think I know what the black box warning is. When you, part is. sure. It's sometimes in, in the farmer universe, it's sometimes called the black box warning where you have to have the, in a pharmaceutical ad, you have the good stuff up front, then you have the warning side and disclaimer in the, minor, in the middle. Side effects and stuff. Side like effects that. and all that. Yeah, yeah. And then they reprise the good stuff at the end. Right, right, gotcha. But under FDA guidelines, you're supposed to present them identically all the way across. That's right. not policed very heavily unless somebody complains. 
Deb right. said in the old days, you could just squeeze it in at the very end. It could be very, very high speed. Mm -hmm. And that's no longer the case. No longer. No longer the case. Yeah. No longer the case at all. Yeah. Yeah. But they'll frequently cast two different people. They'll frequently cast a voice up front that'll do the, you emotional, have this problem right? with this, right. you know, emotional, not too emotional. Then they have the disclaimer in the middle, the, the warning. And frequently they're of two different genders. And then at the end, that other voice comes back. And I'm certain there are reasons. I'm not exactly sure why, but it's such a pattern that there must be a reason that works for the pharmaceutical companies better, for yeah. sure. Yeah. If you're just joining us, our guest is Hugh Klitsky, and we're talking about the elements of your demos, which you all have to have out there. If you've got a question for Hugh about demos and that sort of thing, throw it in the chat room. Jeff Holdman's back there writing everything down and relaying it to us, and we really appreciate his taking the time to do that for us. Um, all right. So when you produce demos... What is the process like for you? How do you do it? There's a lot of talking. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of conversation. You know, there's a whole lot of really understanding. You know, I want to hear the demo that they had before. I want to understand what their experience was like with that. I want to understand what they want to accomplish with a new demo. I want to know why they wanted a new demo now. Is it just simply that the stuff is dated? Is it just simply that... The stuff is, um, they've learned how to read conversationally, you know, better for 2023, as opposed to what was going on in 2019. And once I divine those reasons, just in talking it out, then I'll sit there and really pay attention. I'll have them read for me to really understand what they gravitate towards, what they're good at, what they're not good at. And I'm also willing to, at moments, to say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And I'm listening very objectively and very abstractly to their voices, trying to say, okay, what about, for example, I produced a few elements for somebody's uh, demo, not a full demo, but just a few pieces because he wanted to show himself as being more than just a big voiced guy. And I said, okay, what would you like to be able to show that your current material doesn't? And he had lots of cars and he had lots of really big, huge, aggressive, masculine things. He said, I would love to have a whiskey spot. And I'm like, yep, you absolutely could have a whiskey spot 100% because he was, it, it was, that was important to him. He really wanted that. But then because of his age, I suggested maybe you want healthcare because it would be perhaps you being warm and supportive toward a family member, an older family member, perhaps. But the, but the context of the read, the content in the read would have to express those ideas of support and caring and trust for my family and yours as a, as a subtext in the ideas. And then I said to him, what about this? And I put a polo black spot in front of him and he never thought about that before he never had thought about that and now that that leads his uh his player where it's just a very simple straightforward masculine read and the my my post guy you know uh emailed me back and he said his demo was an absolute pleasure to me and I'm like, then we did it right because suddenly he was doing sexy grandpa for the first time in his <laughs> life, you know, just reading Polo Black. But it's really, you know, again, I think casting is super important. From there, you can have read. And from there, you can then have post and to think about the demo as an object all the way through with variety, with, um, just that hint of entertainment value in those 90 seconds or those 75 seconds that it's something that you want to listen to because that's just going to help. That's going to help your cause. Yeah. But also just to make sure that everything is strongly and specifically in their wheelhouse. Also being willing to take them just outside of it in order to make them feel great about 
the, about presenting themselves. Do you produce entire spots like a, like you were producing a whole commercial? I'll think and then of, lift the the gold out of each spot. How do you? I do. do. That? I yeah. do. I I do that. But I've certainly seen producers that don't. Mm -hmm. And a student of mine once said, "Will you coach me on material for a demo that you're not going to produce?" Which I said, "Absolutely, of course I will." And I was very surprised when she came to me with pieces of commercials. And I didn't question it, but I said, okay. And we worked the material together and everything. And I heard the end result and it, it was great. It was probably one of the best demos I've heard in quite some time where I felt it captured her. It was energetic. It was empathetic, all these things. And I was like, that guy is definitely thinking about the demo object in a different way than me. He had all that mapped out in his imagination before giving it to the talent. Me, I sit there and I'm sitting there taking pieces of things and reorganizing and understanding routining of this piece to that piece to the next piece to the other piece because that's the way that makes sense to me. It's a little bit of my music background. That's a little bit of my theater background, where I'm sitting there understanding the routining of things, the organizing of things, fast to slow, to intimate, to authoritative, to communicative. But I have to feel all that out. This producer, he'd had all that mapped out in his imagination. And I'm just like, good for you, man. You, you nailed it. Fantastic. Yeah. It's completely different ways of thinking. And I think it's important for talent to understand the way a producer works before you pay them anything because then you can understand does this make sense for the way that i would feel most comfortable do i think that that process could bring the best out of me yeah it's it's a lot like home voiceover studios actually because is it? Ev every voice is different every room is different george and i are always like Everything has to be custom designed for that specific person, for their lifestyle, how they live in their house, that sort of thing. And the clearly, physical you're size. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, there's that too. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, so you, what you're doing is good educational stuff. You're getting people to show what's, what individually they're like, and you're working with their individuality to make the demo. Because how many demos do we hear? where it's, okay, of course, the same read all the way through. I'm like, there's no contrast, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, or there's, it, it sounds like they're putting on something that they're really not. Right. And to me, it's always important to be intellectually honest with your demos. I am capable of doing this. And will you be able to reproduce this if you get hired for a gig? Right. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, once, once again, if you've got a question for Hugh about uh, doing your demo or getting demos done or any questions about demos throw it in the chat room right now we'll get to it in our next segment so uh how do you choose the scripts i mean when you're, you're i mean you're interviewing people you're you're asking them all these questions that's how it i mean that that's yeah. it you know really more than anything else it's a fine balance between the things that they're interested in things where they've succeeded perhaps are you booking this do you have that on your current demo no okay let's do that you know let's find a good example of that whatever it is is it mom you know or are you booking you know teen or are you booking young mom versus older mom right because the decisions that in the in the casting again think about it right a young mom is maybe on, is preoccupied with different things and making different decisions than a slightly older mom, for example. Right. You know, they're on an older mom might be on their second car, for example, <laughs> while a young mom may be thinking about, okay, I've got to get rid of the the car that hubby and I had, and we're trading it in for our first uh, family yeah. van, family yeah. van, or whatever. You know, and then how do we feel about that? You know. And how can we talk about that? And how can the emotional subtext resonate around that content? How can, can that actor relate to those ideas in genuine, specific, and as Dan has said correctly, repeatable 
ways. I mean, right. how many talent have explicitly said, I saw the script, I understood it right away, and I got the job? That's because they're speaking from the content of their own experience. And then being able to project that into the content of a script. Right. Acting. Sometimes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it's acting, but it's acting in a void. There's, there are so, now we're sort of to wander off into voiceover training and conversation more, but right. that's okay. Which I do want right? to get into, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. So yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit more around how do, does an actor make, a voice actor make decisions when there's a lot of information that a on-screen actor or on stage actor would have. And they have to fill in the blanks with their imagination. Right. So, yeah, I mean, let's talk a little bit about the conversational read. Uh, sure. I, I, you know, I, you talk to so many people, you know, who coach and, you know, and are in the business and it's like, what is the conversational Look, read? Look, even conversational itself has become something of an anathema, right? right. Conversational has practically become a synonym for um, announcer, practically, <laughs> you know, and it was the first I had heard it at, at Wovo, where suddenly it's like, I don't want to hear that conversational read. I want to hear it authentically. And I'm sitting there listening and I'm going, okay. <laughs> and at times I've heard that read described as real. I've yep. heard that times as described as genuine. I've heard that described as authentic. I've heard it described as the real person read off the street. Right. But I do think that there's a real trend to doing less, but better. And the better doesn't go away. But, and that's, that's not my phrase. That's Dieter Rams. Dieter Rams was, I, I'm saying that right, God. Uh, he was a designer. He did a lot of design for Braun. He was a German designer, very strong in minimalism. And he said, and one of his ethos was less, but better. And when I saw that, I said to myself, yes, that's a great way to try to talk about genuine, authentic, conversational, quote unquote, reads. Yes, you are doing less. However, the subtext has to be stronger. It has to be even more specific now than ever. That if you give multiple takes, maybe you need three different points of view on it. Rather Absolutely. than just pausing or just making new melodies out of it. That's not conversational. It never has been right. that way. In the past, I might have advised people saying, once you make a strong set of decisions, play those decisions three times in a row, and that would be enough variety. I'm starting to question that. I'm starting to say to myself now, okay, maybe now make three different choices and play three different choices and make them strong choices, but still be willing to make three different choices to really reveal different subtexts. Right. That you that can just bring made me to think it. of something. Was yeah. anybody ever recorded in a demo or had in a demo two cuts that are the exact same script, but read and or produced in totally different ways not that the i'm way aware you would have of an audition but i don't with like an a and a b read that would not, never end up on a demo right not that i'm aware of but at the same time if somebody was willing to go outside the box that way and go for it i think that could be interesting i don't want to start a trend here or anything <laughs> but i think that's a i think that's a very very interesting notion I think they that have to it, be really uniquely different read i mean they have I to really that, be saying different things i think that well with their subtext, for example. I think, I think that if they were completely produced completely differently, I think that might mask the, the changes in the read. People might mm. be a little bit more dazzled by the difference in production, Good but at point, the yeah. same time, a different production could highlight different parts of a different approach. Right. It's an, inter it's an interesting question. Yeah. Mm. It's a very, very interesting question, and if somebody did it i think that they would have to do it really really well but also i think it would have to be understood for what it is and i think yeah somebody putting that out and then having somebody else understand what they were doing to be able to appreciate it might be a hurdle a little too high to jump mm -hmm. yeah well let, let's talk about self-direction for a little bit because self-direction is it Possibly, I mean, as a as a as a voice actor with a home studio, self direction is possibly the hardest skill that most people have to pick up because we're we're not directed a lot of times. I mean, if it's a if it's a big commercial with an agency or something, there's always going to be 
you know, conferencing on that and, you know, three guys listening at the same time. But when you're auditioning, how do you, how do you, what are some of the keys to good self-direction so that, you know, when your audition goes out there, you've made, you've made choices, whether the right choices or not. Sometimes the wrong choice is what's going to get their attention uh, when, when you send out an audition like that. Well, the first thing I say is that when you do multiple takes, the first thing I advise people to do is to listen to them in the reverse order that they record. Because that affords just a hint more objectivity. There's something about taking the time to experience it. Take three first, then take two, and then take one. That gives you a chance to just be able to get a bit of more of a 10,000 foot view for a moment. Because the goal should really be objective, if at all possible. And when I say objectivity, to not judge yourself, to be able to listen to yourself inquisitively and attentively, but somewhat dispassionately, to be able to say, okay, what did I do? Because from there, you can begin to adjust. If you hit some, a word too hard, for example, or you stress the point, you have to be careful not to kid yourself. Oh, is somebody going to miss that? No, they're going to hear it. They're going to hear it. But don't judge yourself because that's the thing that you did. You need to recognize that you did it. And then to say, okay, perhaps you say to yourself, all right, I hear that on this next take. That's not going to be a problem because I understand I did that before. And that's one way to, another way to really begin to start to give yourself permission to improve by saying, this is what I've done. Listening with your eyes shut is very, very good because it's the only people I think that really follow along with the script that closely are the writers, <laughs> you know, in general, and they're not the decision makers more often than not, Yeah, you know? Maybe they are, maybe they're not, I don't know. But again, just that bit, a little more objectivity to listen with the eyes shut, to really understand it. And this sounds silly, but I tell people too, when you're listening, don't smush up your face. Don't sit there and just go, no, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. <laughs> get a little, get a little Zen, just a right. little, just a little. <laughs> Because it'll it'll help you to it, it'll help you to hear. It'll help you to hear and then be able to go, the yeah, that was fast. So how do I, now I'm gonna slow that down. Exactly. And when you begin to self-direct, do one thing. Just one. Where it's like, this time I'm gonna go slower. And then mm -hmm. understand, yes that the next take it's going to happen, you're going to allow yourself to go slow. And then see how that affects things. I'm not going to hit that, that brand as hard. Right. And now see how that affects everything that goes on. All right. Our guest, once again, if you're just wondering, is Hugh Klitsky, and we're talking about getting your demos right. And if you've got a question, now would be a fabulous time to throw it in the chat room. And we will get to those questions right after the break, which we're going to take right now. So don't go away. We'll be right back here on Voice Over Body Shop. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez. And you're enjoying Dan and George on the Voice Over Body Shop. Have you noticed the specific demands of clients regarding our home VO studios? Are they at a professional level to record for broadcast? And what does that mean? To me, it means it doesn't sound bad. I've seen several now demanding cardioid condenser microphones. Some are great, and cheap ones not so great. So how do you choose? It's like standing in the checkout line at the supermarket, deciding which candy or mints you want to buy. So which is right for you? Make it easy on yourself and get the Harlan Hogan Signature Series VO1A, the first and only mic designed for voiceover performers by a voiceover performer. The VO1A faithfully captures deep tones without sounding bassy and has a silky smooth top end that's never harsh. A perfect sound palette for both male and female voiceover performers. 
Get the complete kit with my cable and shock mount now. Go to voiceoveressentials.com where you'll see all their great products made just for us voiceover people. Well, I'd like to tell you guys about our sponsor, Source Elements. The creators of Source Connect and Source Nexus and a lot of other tools. And if you haven't been to the site lately, I recommend you head over there because they've had a whole site redesign. They have a lot more useful educational content to help you feel oriented with what their tools are, what they're capable of doing. And it's a really good idea to get acquainted. If you don't know what Source Connect is, it's a tool used to connect studios to studios around the world. That includes yours. And if you want to be available for the big gigs and possibly remotely producing your next demo, because a lot of demo producers also use Source Connect, you might want to get ready. So head over there, get yourself set up with a subscription so they can get you onboarded, help you get set up, and all that will be included in the cost of your subscription when you do that. So source-elements.com, get started today. I don't think there's a feeling quite like that moment when something you've auditioned for becomes something you get booked on, especially when it comes to audiobooks. You audition for an audiobook on ACX or in some other form or fashion, and then somebody says, hey, we like what you did. We want you to be our narrator. If that isn't a feeling that you've had lately because either you haven't figured out how to do audiobooks or because the efforts that you've put toward audiobooks just don't seem to be working, I've got a solution for you. Let's start with some free videos and then, if you want, registering for the ACX Masterclass. I'm David H. Lawrence the 17th, along with Dan O'Day, I teach that class. And you can get to those free videos and to registration if you'd like at acxmasterclass.com slash join. That's acxmasterclass.com slash join. I'd love to help you get there. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Widom. VOBS.TV. And we're back with Hugh Klitsky. Once again, if you have a question, throw it in the chat room. And we got a bunch of questions for you from our worldwide audience that is tuning in specifically to hear you tonight, Hugh. So uh, let's let's move to those. I'm, I'm excited. Oh, I'll, do my, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. George, you get Mr. Romero's question. All right. Frank asks, so what's the current trend on length of demos? You meant you alluded to it earlier, um, but um, are yeah, we first... getting to short demo singularity? He said <laughs> to short demo singularity. I, <laughs> I think that I think the pl I think players are really interesting. I at first I kind of again. Coming from the agency world, I just kind of at first turn, turned my nose up to them. But I thought to myself, I realized from a very practical sense, somebody goes to your site, they can pick, bing, 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 go through and hear them one by one and pick what they want. That's really interesting. And that's really, really compelling. I think overall, it's important to have a, a full demo object, though. It's, you know, traditionally 60 seconds. Sometimes it can go longer. I don't think you need to be slavish to that. But 75 seconds is okay. I wouldn't go past, I wouldn't go to, to 90. I would probably hang around 60, 67 seconds, somewhere around in there. But you've, it's got to hold their attention if you're going to do it for that long. Yeah. Yeah. Which is no easy feat. Yeah. For uh, sure. Yeah. Kate on YouTube asks, do you need to build a portfolio or is it case by case? I guess when you're working with somebody, um, you know, the I'm type, not sure. type yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I'm what not sure what it. a portfolio is exactly. I'm not quite sure. Well, I th I think with a demo, you're the different types of reads that you would do. Uh, you know, not just strictly commercial, but but you need to have a commercial demo and a narration demo and uh -huh. and these various other things. Uh, or, but I think what she means is, do you look and see? Well, you need to have this kind of a demo, and then maybe you should try doing one like that, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm not. I've never really been a fan of what's sometimes called the hybrid demo because I think that's a little confusing. I think people, people will always take the path of least, least resistance where it's, I want to hear what I hear. And then I want to hear the commercials. I want to hear them do narration. I want to hear them do audiobooks. 
And so I wouldn't, or I would want to hear them do promos. There was right. a trend for a little while of blending promo and commercial together. I never understood that hmm. quite because those are two really, really different things. But then promo readers starting to ha started to have to do more commercials. So then it was like a promo demo with some commercial elements in, in it, <clears throat> hmm. like brought to you by the old school. That way had become a, a trend coming back. And then agents had to go in and negotiate saying, no, 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 that's a commercial. You need to pay like that's a commercial, but it's a but it's in the context of the dump of a of a promo. No, no, no. So something like that maybe should go on a promo demo. That little bit of commercial segment, for example. Yeah, and, and I've and, and I've differentiated my demos and you know, strictly commercial, strictly announcer. I'm like, well, I I need an announcer demo because that's what I get hired for. And, uh, you know, you have to know who you are and your market in order to do those different things. Some people have commercial announcer and some people have commercial conversational. Right. I've seen that. I think that's fine. Yeah. Tell me in the chat room. So what if it says, com what if it says, uh, conversational, but not announcery? <laughs> <laughs> are we talking about straightations of uh, whatever an announcer is? There's like over the top announcer. There's well, what they're saying, they just said yeah. the phrase conversational, but not announcery. So that means it's conversational, right? Right. Right. I guess that was tying into the whole point of that. Conversational is the new announcer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, but there are reasons why too, I think, because it's, yeah, it, it's so difficult to describe, but if you hear it, it's like, you could you could hear that the way the pause is used in an announcer way, but the read and the phrasing is conversation. Mm. So that can happen a lot in broadcast television or in podcasts. So it's like the net result is this kind of a hybrid thing. Mm. But since the pandemic has ended, there's the trend towards less and less and and speaking in the natural tessitura in the natural register not pushed in any way at all to make things as if you are speaking to somebody who's so close you could reach out and put your hand on their forearm that right. physically close to you actually speaking of trends one of the things that i do which some find controversial for some reason but I make processing presets for people's auditions. And so one of the things that we, that I'm doing is I'm making judgment calls about EQ, for example, the balance of low end to high end, you know, and tilting that back and forth, right? Or some of both, right? And um, have you found there's any kind of trend in terms of what's booking in terms of EQ? Because I'm I am hearing that brighter and less warm and less, Brighter and brighter is more of the trend, but I don't know if you've heard of a trend that way. I have not heard of a trend that way. And because so much of what I do is focused on the read, yeah. I'm smart enough to let that live with guys like you yeah. about EQ and about home studio setup and about presets and all of that kind of thing. I can press record, I can press stop, I can edit. Mm -hmm. And then I'm smart enough to stop talking. <laughs> where I'm just sort of like, no, I'm going to go farm this out to my post guy because that's his thing. Yeah. You know, I can make music choices. I can edit the music. I can understand the relationship between where I want the music to exist next to the, to, uh, to the narration. Yeah. And I can add sound design and I can make those choices and understand where all those things go aesthetically. And then I stop. Mm -hmm. and I press that that thing called export, and I send it to other people with the other mm -hmm. skill set mm -hmm. to mix and master and clean up and do all of the posts on right. that right. that way. Yeah, because so, that's not my that's not my strength. That's not my strength as a producer. Yeah, uh, AJB voice actor who's listening and watching on YouTube. Is it? okay not to use a brand name in your demo 
seems sort of self-defeating, wouldn't it? I, there were a couple of interesting theories around that. Um, somebody said to me once, you know, you know, you, you know, it's like you play a demo for somebody for five people, you're going to get five different opinions. Right. And there were very interesting opinions around that. Some people felt like you didn't need the brand name because the brand was the most important thing was the read. I thought that was interesting. Other people said, if you don't put the brand in there, they're going to get confused to know what the hell you're talking about. But if you put the brand in there, that might confuse them more because they may think, oh, they've booked this. Therefore, I can't use them for this. Or they may have non-compete, which means they may not be able to go out for this. Mm -hmm. right? So... Yeah. All of those thoughts and those thinking, suddenly you can give yourself a massive headache just trying to second guess every possible negative opinion. So I'm always of the mind where, and sometimes now, they don't even have the brand name in the finished spot. How many car commercials have we seen where it's a wonderfully written script? They don't even name the car. It's just on the screen as a logo. At the right. end. Some moments I've sat there and said, say the name of the car. Just put it in there. It's going to button it all nicely. Just do it. Why? Because the script seems to need it. That's why. And then I go back and I listen to it and I'm like, yep, good. I'm glad we have that. Or, no, 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 it's more about them. Get the, get the name out of there. I don't want that. You have to make all of these aesthetic decisions, all of these choices. And somebody made a mistake and somebody got punished for it. And suddenly somebody thinks that's gospel and the only way to do it. <laughs> and that's just not the way the world works. That sometimes people never get caught and sometimes people do get caught. And sometimes an agency complains when they hear their stuff used and other times they don't complain it's very very all over the place and there are no hard and fast rules but you can sit there and you need to pay strong attention to the things that can show you off to the very best of your ability if you're a if you're a ballerina and you're exquisite at dancing balanchine you should with or without permission you should do that because you have that skill set and if, balance, and if the estate complains, maybe then you have to adjust. But you're not pretending to be a Balanchine-trained dancer because the man has been dead for a very long time. It's now, you know, with his estate. You right. understand what I'm saying? Yeah. There are mm -hmm. all kinds of reasons why to do things and to not do things. You have to make sure that, this, that the choices that are made on your behalf serve you first. Mm. Right. Uh, Great point. Well, yeah, question from Debbie Irwin, because she's here. Uh, which man would you like to introduce me on my demo? Sexy grandpa? Uh, joking aside, <laughs> well, that's a creative choice, too. Not all male voices are the same. And if that's the first thing a person is hearing, you know, if, if, especially so if you're introducing. Slate. Yeah, male slate for a female uh, voice actor. <laughs> What's the question, Deb? <laughs> What, who would you want on the front of her demo? Of her demo? Yeah. What, what sexy grandpa oh, does, does Debbie think, need to have on I her? Think, I, I could see her as, you know, being, you know, a, a, a Sam Elliott kind of a girl. I could see that, you know. <laughs> okay. You know, just go, just go right straight up and down famous that way. Or maybe, maybe, you know, I could see her with a cowboy, though. So maybe like, you know, K-Cos or something like that. Little Kevin Costner up front you know you know bringing mm -hmm. some bringing some of the the california cowboy reel that he can that he does you know mcconaughey might might trend a little bit too just a little too young you know she did say se which sexy grandpa should be on the front of her demo so yeah i would say either you go for the class the vintage or you go for the classic right mm -hmm. you've got the question from jeff ciarto all right he says uh at time find the times i end up reading too much into the script and extremely critical of what i've done much to my detriment um uh, it's his thoughts and then it says i wasn't conversational 
oh, the thoughts in his head are things like, I wasn't conversational or I'm too much announcer. Um, I guess he wants to know how to get that out of his head, I guess. Hard for me to answer that without actually talking to the person, but I would suggest that if they could get just a little bit of distance, just a touch, even if mm. it's recording it, stopping, not listening back, standing up, going away, but then really going away, you know, go do half a half the dishes or something you know and, and then and listen again yeah. and then come back and listen again just with trying to just let yourself understand that you got to get a little bit of space just a little bit of space yeah i like your idea of closing your eyes while you're listening back and you know and asking yourself the question did i make myself clear in what i was saying but or did i just sound like i was reading a bunch of words did i really communicate it and if you close your eyes, I mean, I usually have to close my eyes when listening to people anyway, because they're going so fast and you have visual stimulation and sometimes I can't follow both at, at once. So yep. just really focusing in on your voice is, is really important. When um, I, when I directed a lot, when I directed all those auditions, I would close my eyes all the time. But then I began to realize that as a coach, I had to temper that because when I was directing an audition, I didn't care how you got there. All I cared was how was that you did get there. So right. I'm giving you a direction note. I don't care how you get there, get there. And then I want to hear it. But when I'm coaching someone, it's very different because I have to balance being objective and understanding what they're doing with understanding how they're doing it and then being able to correct their how. Hmm. So I, I've mm -hmm. had to temper some of my own process as I've moved from purely directing to coaching with some direction, right. it's, it's very different. It's kind of like when we, we, we listen to audio and we want the audio raw and we know the producers want the audio raw, but we do know that some people are still going to be doing some processing. And is that wrong? Because is it better that they, everything they do be technically pure or is it better what they do sound technically good right and so we fight that little battle i think i do anyway fight that little battle at times so it feel it ties in a little bit to what we do from yeah. a technical standpoint yeah mike derner who provided us with this lovely mic flag uh, asks what should never go in a demo the offbeat for its own sake hmm. the the, the thing I wanted to include just because I liked it, that you, everything has to have a purpose. Right. Oh, I just threw in this, I just threw in this old spot because I booked it and I liked it. No, it sounds like an old spot. It, it just is an old spot. Oh, this was the thing I used, I was known for. Right. Mm. No, you're looking to address marketplace right now. Yeah. You know, things like that. Things that just sound wildly out of out of production character, you know, just so different. Where it's jarring. Where suddenly I'm not listening to you read. I'm listening to the audio quality of that thing. Right. All righty. Well, Hugh, thanks so much for being with us tonight, and uh, and and give imparting this information to us. If they want to get a hold of you, and if they want some coaching on it. Where would they go? I would imagine it's okay. So it's it's over that. that. <laughs> I don't know which way to go. So my own site is a disaster, but it's a disaster in process. So I direct everybody to vonow.co, and if you go there, you'll find the coaching and classes page, and you can book a free consultation. And yes, it's just click on it. We have a conversation. We set up a time. They usually are about 30 minutes. Usually they run longer. And then we can talk about you. Usually I give people scripts up front so they have something they can read for me. I can critique you a little bit. And then to really try to understand what it is that you're looking for and how I might be able to help. you. So vonow.co, go to the classes and coaching, hit on the one that, of the photo that looks like me, 
you know, as opposed <laughs> to the beautiful photo of Deb Irwin, who's there too. And, you know, set up a, a free consultation with me and I'd love to talk with you. All righty. Well, thanks for being with us tonight. We really appreciate your time and uh, you imparting you. your wisdom. And it's just great to see you again, too. Great to see you, too. All righty. Great nice to meet you, George. You. Thanks. All right. Well, we'll be right back and uh, wrap things up and re-rack it for Tech Talk right after these important messages. So don't go away. You're still watching VOBS? Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. There's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products, and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. VoiceOver Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources, and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions, bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, home studio setup, and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Well, here's something I don't normally do. I just hit the timer. 60 seconds to talk about voiceactor.com. What is voiceactor.com? It is a place to get, if you're, if you're just starting out in voiceover, you have to have a website. No matter where you are, once you get your demos, and we've been talking about demos the whole night, you've got to get them on a website. What do you need on a website? You need your name, your demos, and your contact information. And you're not going to dazzle people with artistic expression so much with your website. So what they do at voiceactor.com is they have templated websites where you can go in Insert your information easily, maybe change the color of the backgrounds a little bit, add your own pictures, but you can literally be online in half an hour to 45 minutes as opposed to six months. So go over on over to voiceactor.com and get your website set up now. We are the World Voices Organization, also, also known, known as WOVO. WOVO. We're the not-for-profit Industry Association of Freelance Voice Talent. VoiceOver is a complex entrepreneurial business. WOVO is there to promote the professional nature of voice work to the public, to those already established in their voiceover practice, and to those who want to pursue voiceover as a career. Membership benefits include a supportive and creative community, a profile and demos on voiceover.biz, our searchable directory of vetted professional voice talent, our exclusive demo player for your personal website. Our mentoring program, business resources, and our video library. Our annual WovoCon conference, a fun and educational weekend with other members with, with the chance, chance to, to learn, learn and, and network. network. Webinars and great speakers and weekly social chats with other members around the world. If your world is voiceover, make Wovo part of it. World Voices Organization. We, we speak, speak for those who speak, speak for a living. living. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Alas Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Yes, you are. And uh, next week on this very show, we will have Tech Talk number 105. Unless, of course, you are watching the show live right at this moment, you could just stay with us and we will get into Tech Talk and you can ask your questions in real time and George and I will answer them in real time, whether they're the right answers or not. So I just sure put mine into chat GPT. And oh, okay. Then, uh, <laughs> read back whatever comes out. <laughs> because you've written so much already, it's going to just regurgitate everything you've already written anyway. It will well, just convincingly familiar. lie about the facts <laughs> for you. That's why you're here after all, right? <laughs> yes. Anyway, our thanks to Hugh Klitsky for joining us tonight because imparting all that very important wisdom about demos because it's a really important piece of our, our business. Uh, let's see. Uh, you still have a coupon for uh, people who will go over to George the Tech. We still give you guys ten percent off. I don't see it used very often, which is fine, bizarre, but van <laughs> v o b s fan ten still gets you ten percent off any services bookings at George the dot Tech. Right, and you can find me over at homevoiceoverstudio dot com where 
Yeah, that's where I do my thing with helping you with your home studio when I'm not doing voiceover work for all my major clients all over the world, which is fun stuff. Uh, speaking of people all over the world, who are our donors of the week? Well, we start off with Grace Newton. Christopher Epperson. Robert Leadham. Stephen Chandler. Casey Clack. Jonathan Grant. Tom Pinto. Greg Thomas. A Doctor Voice. Antland Productions. Martha Kahn. 949 Designs. Sarah Borges. Philip Sapir. Brian Page. Patty Gibbons. Rob Ryder. Shauna Pennington Baird. Don Griffith. Trey Mosley. Uh, Diana Birdsall. There she is. Maria <laughs> Mackis. And Sandra Manwiller. Thanks, everybody. That's how we keep this show technically perfect because you guys are contributing and we really, really appreciate it. Also, join our mailing list. If you go to our website or if you're watching from our website right, right now, go down there where it says <laughs> join our, our, our mailing list. And that way you'll get a notice of what's coming up this week and reminding you real close to when we do it. So we're like, oh, I should do this now. So join the mailing list. Uh, a big thank you to our amazing sponsors, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActor.com. And, and WorldVoices.org. World World-Voices.org. Voice Voices. Where I am the president and you will join now. Uh, thanks to Jeff Holman for getting all those questions for us in the chat room. We really appreciate that. And Sue Merlino for directing the show tonight and making it technically perfect. No mistakes tonight at all. Anyway, uh, that's going to do it for us this week. We're going to re-rack it and set for Tech Talk. Come on, stick around, ask your questions, listen to George and I talk about home voiceover studios because no one knows more about them than we do. Uh, so guess what? This is not an easy business. That's why we're here to give you the information on all of these different things that run together in our business, all the things you got to know and along with the technical stuff. So it's not easy to get everything right, but we have discovered that if it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard. <laughs> And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Stay tuned for Tech Talk.